many grooves are there on a vinyl LP? I have Dark Side of the Moon here. It's a pretty battered old copy. I've just cleaned it, so it's got a new inner sleeve. And then we can ask, like, how many grooves? Well, the answer is two. One on this side, one on this side. Like a, a spiral groove, right? Two. Two. <laughs> Let's put this away. Yeah, we'll just put it down there. All right, next question. How many audio tracks are encoded on the surface of a CD? This is Banco de Gaia's Live at Glastonbury, but the deluxe edition from a couple of years ago. So on the surface of this CD, how many audio tracks are encoded on there? The answer is one, because there's a table of contents at the start of the inner side of the CD, I think, that tells the CD player to advance the track number at certain times, so it gives the illusion that there are many tracks. And then when you rip this CD to a hard drive, it is ripped as many tracks. Now that sets the stage for this very kind of long and winding video today, which is on the surface, it's gonna be about this thing, but in reality, it's gonna be about far more than just this AudioLab 6000A play integrated amplifier. So I had planned to make this video earlier in the year, but it kept getting pushed back by more contemporary and more deserving gear. Now, contemporary, well, this thing came out, I think in 2020, this particular version of the AudioLab amplifier. In terms of deserving, <laughs> well, this 6000A play from AudioLab for me, is the very definition of heaven and hell. Let's talk about the heaven first, because this is a very solid, chunky, well-made, in fact, it's beautifully made, this, this amplifier. It's really nicely put together. It has a very satisfying clunk when we turn it on. There's a very basic but good screen. I don't like screens that I can't read from the listening position. This is not one of those. I can read you know, the volume level and the input here quite easily from my chair over there. There are three very satisfying buttons to turn. Buttons, knobs. So this is the volume wheel, feels good. Source selector over here also feels good. And then this one is quite unusual because this is allows us to move the amplifier from integrated mode to pre-power mode. Pre-power mode means we can use it as a power amp. We move it to preamp mode and we can use it as a preamp. So that's quite unusual for an amplifier at this price point, a thousand euros. I've been using it in integrated mode. The 6000A Play gives us 50 watts per channel. Almost got that wrong. 50 watts per channel into eight ohms, 75 watts per channel into four ohms. There is a MM Phono stage inside, which I have used. I have nothing to complain about with that. It's pretty damn good. There is a DAC inside, also pretty damn good for the thousand euro price point. So that's the, the basics of this amplifier. On sound quality, this thing is detailed, it's transparent, it's gutsy, it sounds fantastic. It's a superb match for the Golden Ear BRX, which I've got partnered up at the moment. Really, really good. And the only thing that really separates it from the NAD M10 V2 is it isn't quite as detailed. I mean, the M10 V2 really goes much further on detail. And this thing isn't quite as robust with dynamics as the NAD. But I can't really complain about that. Not at the thousand euro price point. Similarly, it's not quite as finessed as the name Unity Atom, which I really love. But let's not forget that the NAD and the name sell for, yeah, about three times the price of this thing. So whatever Audio Lab have done inside this in terms of amplification, They've knocked it out of the park. It is bloody fantastic. Now, like the name, like the NAD, this is a streaming amplifier. 
But this one's a bit different than the name and the NAD. We can stream wired or wirelessly. I recommend going wired, not because it's any more robust in terms of signal or it sounds any different. It's just that I think that these wireless aerials, I'm not a fan of the look. So if we operate this thing in wired mode using an ethernet cable, which I have done, then we can just push these out of the way, out of sight as much as we possibly can. That one needs a little bit of help. And yeah, there we go. A much cleaner looking unit. Now on streaming inputs, there is no room ready. There is no Apple AirPlay and there is no Chromecast. There is only Spotify Connect and DTS PlayFi. And that's how this unit gets its name. That's what the play means on the end of the 6000A. 6000A play refers to DTS PlayFi. There's a little bit of a quirk here in that Spotify Connect is not up and running out of the box. We have to get the DTS PlayFi app available for Android and iOS, install that, set that up, and then add Spotify Connect to that. And then that seems to sort of activate something inside the unit and then Spotify Connect is running from there on after. It's just a one, one shot deal really to get it set up. Note, Spotify Connect does not bring this amplifier out of standby as it does on the name and the NAD. For couch turkeys like me, we have a remote wand. And yes, right there is a red hot chili peppers button. Marvelous. Now Spotify Connect behaves exactly as it does on other units as we'd expect, in that the stream does not travel through the phone. When we instigate a stream, it basically hands off the URL of that stream to the Audio Lab amp. Secondly, playback is gapless. But that's something we cannot say about all other streams that run through the DTS PlayFi portion of this streaming amplifier. Before we get to that, another usability note, you can do multi-room with DTS PlayFi if you're happy to forego anything above 16-bit and 48 kilohertz. There is something called critical listening mode inside the DTS PlayFi app. If you engage that, then you forego multi-room, but you get support for up to 24192. PlayFi supports a range of streaming services, of music streaming services. The big ones are Tidal, Cobas, Amazon Music. Now here comes the first wrinkle. Just like Apple AirPlay, anything streamed with PlayFi from Tidal, Cobas, Amazon Music will travel through the phone before it is handed off to the Audio Lab unit. That makes the phone fundamental to the stream's routing. So that means your phone or your tablet must always be turned on and within range of your Wi Fi network when you're streaming with this Audio Lab amplifier. And if we move our phone into flight mode or airplane mode, the music stops, just as it does with AirPlay. Well, kind of, AirPlay is, allows you to you kind of get around that now, but I won't go into that with this video because it's not relevant to DTS PlayFi. But unlike AirPlay, if we close the DTS PlayFi app or we restart our phone, when we restart the PlayFi app, it doesn't remember what track or album or track position that we were last playing. Now the weird thing is, is that when I use Apple AirPlay in this house, I don't have any problems with streaming. It never glitches, it never kind of stops and then starts. And if it does, it's super rare. But I can't say that about DTS PlayFi. So on my Google Pixel 6, the stream glitches quite often. Like yesterday and this morning I was testing it again, still glitches. It, it's less of a problem with my iPhone 13 mini. Maybe the Wi-Fi aerials are better in that thing. But let's be charitable and let's just chalk that up to my crappy Wi-Fi network here because I'm just 
talking to a Fritz box in the corner of the room over there that, that handles my Wi-Fi. So it's pretty basic, it's nothing fancy, and maybe my Wi-Fi network just isn't good enough to do PlayFi proper justice. But let's say we get up and running with a stream and it's completely smooth, because it, it obviously does happen. Then we hit another pothole. In that, the streaming playback on DTS PlayFi is not gapless. Now, if you're a playlists kind of person, this likely won't bother you at all because you're moving from this track from this album to this track from another album to that track from another album. But if you're like me and you're an albums kind of person or a classic albums kind of person, well, let's just say I hope you're sitting down because the gaps that are inserted by the PlayFi module in here between every track that we play through this amplifier, it's not like Chromecast where it's like half a second or a quarter of a second. This thing inserts, and I've timed it several times, five second gaps between tracks. Five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> Now this affects every live album. It affects every DJ mix. It affects many classical pieces. It affects many operatic pieces. Because, let me tell you why, is if you're like me, music is a form of hypnosis. And so the transition between tracks being invisible, being no gap as the artist intended, when gaps are inserted by our streaming platform, it sort of jolts us out of that hypnosis. It ruins the illusion, for me at least, anyway. So I've written a short list of albums that I think are completely ruined by the PlayFi module in here in that it adds full five second gaps between tracks. So for example, The Future Sound of London's Life Forms, UF Orb by The Orb, Live Rust by Neil Young, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway by Genesis, Daft Punk Alive 2007, Wish You Were Here and Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, Laurie Anderson's Big Science, Marillion's Misplaced Childhood, The Cure's 17 Seconds, the second side of Kate Bush's The Hounds of Love. You know, it even affects this, Banco de Gaia's Live at Glastonbury. In fact, gapped playback ruins every single album in Banco de Gaia's catalogue because they all rely on seamless transitions between tracks, i.e. no gaps between those tracks, because they blend into one another. But it's not just continuously mixed albums like Dark Side of the Moon or The Banco de Gaia that are affected by the five second gaps that the Audio Lab unit inserts between tracks. It affects ordinarily gapped albums. And I'll give you an example. In 1985, Talking Heads released Little Creatures. It's got And She Was on it, Road to Nowhere, it was a big hit for them. I mention this because I have been listening to this album for, is it 36 years? It's 36 years, right? It's a long, long time. I know this album like it's part of me. It's like, it's in here, right? And that includes the cadence of the gaps between the tracks. So when the first track, And She Was, ends, in my head I know when the next track, Give Me Back My Name, should start. And it's like half a second, and the cadence of that gap is important because, and she was, ends, and then Give Me Back My Name starts, right? Now, this thing, putting five seconds between those two processes, for me, spoils the enjoyment of the album. I know I'm being nitpicky about gapped albums, but because the gaps are so large here, five seconds, it's not just a dark side of the moon kind of problem. It goes beyond that. To use some modern promotional vernacular, this experience, this listening experience, is not as the artist intended. It's nowhere near it.
Now, to be fair to Audio Lab, none of this, none of it is their fault. The issues of the stream traveling through the phone, and more importantly, the five second gaps, are DTS's problems to solve if they want to. I mean, of course they don't have to. They could just happily just keep selling this, and I would just keep telling you this is good if you only listen to playlists. Of course, I'm not telling you not to buy this. I'm just telling you what I perceive to be a deal breaker. I mean, five second gaps between tracks for me is my personal idea of streaming playback hell. But you might not agree. So if gapless playback is important to you, or if it's not, or if you don't care, please let us know in the comments section below. Now remember at the start of this video, how I explained that there are two grooves on a vinyl record, one on each side. There is one audio track on a CD. That's why those formats are gapless, because they're only dealing with one groove per side or one track on a CD. They're both gapless. So are audio cassettes. Streaming is the only format, I think, in the history of audio formats that has moved us in many situations to gapped playback. And there's a reason for it. It's because the streaming hardware in a product like this is trying to create a single stream of music from, let's say, 10, 12, 15 tracks on an album. And to do that, it has to have a multi-threaded process. So that means that whilst one track is playing, another process will preload the next track so that when this one finishes, the stream can be handed off immediately to the next track. Think of it like a relay race where one runner is passing off the baton, the baton for Americans, to the other runner. They have to kind of get up to speed so that the transition is seemingly seamless, right? That's how gapless playback is generally handled. I don't know what's going on with PlayFi. Maybe they've only got a single threaded process so they have to play the one track, then when it gets to the end, it then then preloads the next track and then resumes. Maybe that's why there's a five second gap. But this problem has already been licked by the likes of Tidal Connect, Spotify Connect, Rune, some UPnP streaming platforms. Now, what about workarounds? Because there are some, I'm pretty sure you can set up a Squeezebox server and have that stream to the PlayFi input here because it's effectively UPnP, I think. Similarly, you can use Bubble UPnP on an Android phone to kind of get it to stream gaplessly to this, but both of those situations either involve an extra box or they involve something that I call a kludge. It's not an elegant fix, and you shouldn't have to fix something that costs a thousand euros. We could also add a Raspberry Pi to the back of this to access its DAC using its USB. Oh no, hang on a minute, that's not true because there's no USB port on the back of this thing. That's the bad news. Now, what's the good news here? Well, Audio Lab make something called a 6000A, which still has the phono stage, it still has the DAC, but it doesn't have the DTS PlayFi module. And if you buy that, you save 250 euros. And that 250 euros can be used to add your own streamer to the internal DAC. So you could buy something from Argon Audio. They have a streamer that does Rune, Chromecast, AirPlay for 250 bucks. It's Wi-Fi only, but I've, I've not tried it, but apparently it's very good. Or you could add a coaxial or Toslink type hat to a Raspberry Pi and have a little mini streamer like that that feeds into the back of this. You could add a Chromecast audio dongle, but that's not gapless either, but the gaps are smaller. So when you connect a third party streaming solution to the back of the 6000A, so not this version, the one without the PlayFi module, you have got a fantastic sounding situation. Because as I've said, 
the amplifier here sounds incredible for the money. It is bloody fantastic. I also have to clarify once again, I'm not saying don't buy the 6000A Play. It would be arrogant of me to say that because not everybody is going to see this product the way I do. But some people do. And I did a survey of my YouTube audience asking them how important gapless playback is to them. And I think around didn't even know what gapless is. And that's a problem because some people could buy this and then not realize that the gaps are there and then be you know, feel disappointed with their purchase. 50% of people are like, I don't care whether it's gapless either way. Fair enough. So those people would probably ignore what I have to say about this product in this video. But around 30% of people said to me that gapless is essential to them. So those people are probably not going to want to buy this. So I'm just trying to point out there's a range of opinions to be had. But the overriding point here is that you still got to check it out. You still have to know what's inside this amplifier. In a few weeks, I'm going to be reviewing the NAD M10 V2. Imagine if I reviewed that, but didn't talk about the streaming module inside. That wouldn't be cool. So I'm just letting you know what's inside this, how it matters or why it matters to people like me who are album listeners and who value gapless playback. One more thought, and this is important because when people like me, reviewers like me, pick fault with a product, we have to do so fairly and carefully because you can't just dismiss something, say it's crap, tell your audience not to buy it. Because if your audience is big enough, effectively you're messing with that manufacturer's bottom line and therefore you're messing with the people that work for that company and their incomes because there are staff that work for Audio Lab. When you pick fault with a product, you have to do it as fairly as you possibly can so that you're not seen as somebody who's just going this, oh, gap playback, rubbish, don't buy it. No, I don't feel that way about this. I'm just saying that this is for a very particular kind of listener, somebody who doesn't care about gaps and probably somebody who plays just lots of multi-artist playlists, or somebody who just uses Spotify. So even if you didn't agree with my opinion of this product, if you felt that this video was informative nonetheless, please give it a like down below. If you like my attitude towards hi-fi and high-end audio, in that I don't see it as my job to tell you what to buy or what not to buy, but rather, tell you what I have found out so that you can make your own decision, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Now another album, Ooh, just turned off so you can see it goes into auto standby.